Okay. Um, so my name is Tom Howley. I, I work in HP on the what we call the lifecycle management component of the of our private cloud platform. So what I'd like to cover today is kind of some of the concepts we have in using Ansible for for deploying OpenStack, um, and this is basically the, the kind of the key job of the lifecycle manager um, within the, the Haas platform. And the, some of the things I want to cover today is basically kind of our idea of the, the deployment lifecycle. So one of the key points being that, you know, it's not just about the initial deployment, it's what we do to the cloud after we deployed it, how we upgrade it, how we reconfigure it, how we carry out maintenance operations. So, I'll, you know, I'll go through the kind of the model that we have with the various operations that a, a typical cloud operator might need to carry out and how we've mapped this to our particular Ansible implementation. I'll give a special mention to upgrade because this is still always a, a challenging problem and if I have time at the end, I'll also mention a bit about how we, how we go about testing um, the particular set of playbooks that we've written for, for deploying uh, OpenStack clouds. So in, in terms of the, um, it's probably worth mentioning a bit of uh, certainly my background in deploying clouds within HP. So when I, when I started working in HP, we, we were beginning to stand up a public cloud. And so this would have been kind of Diablo timeframe. And then later on, we, we spun up a separate region based on Grizzly. The deployment at the time was based on Chef. And I guess we, and this is, you know, updating, we, we got experience of updating a, a fairly reasonably large uh, public cloud deployment, certainly quite large for, for the time. This, this is roughly five years ago. And, you know, through writing chef, um, chef cookbooks and recipes and basically, you know, we learned about the various, <coughs> excuse me, trials and tribulations of, of managing uh, updates of cloud. And, and then later on, we would have had experience with using the triple O um, deployment platform as it was for, for deploying OpenStack Cloud. And I think this combination has hopefully fed into some of the ideas that we have around the lifecycle manager and how we, how we go about managing the whole lifecycle of, of an OpenStack cloud. So in terms of um, the design of the lifecycle manager, uh, some kind of major goals that we want to address were, uh, well, first of all, we wanted something that's reasonably flexible. So our customers, um, you know, we learned they don't just want to install one particular kind of template of a cloud. They have various requirements around how the services are laid out, how your networks are laid out, different types of isolation between different types of traffic, um, how your disks are laid out for various types of services. So we tried to build this, build this in from the beginning that we have you know, a, a quite, quite a flexible range of options for how we deploy the cloud. And this is kind of outside of the actual configuration of the services themselves, which is another aspect of, of um, the flexibility and configuration. Then when it comes to the, the lifecycle management, the, the key thing that we um, you know, especially learned from public cloud and, and the use of triple O was that you need to think about um, what you're gonna be doing after your deployment from the very beginning. So how you design your, you know, whatever tooling you use, with, <coughs> whether it's Chef, Puppet, Bash, Ansible, um, it's really important to think about how you're going to use the same set of um, code for updating your cloud after your initial deployment. So, you know, initial deployment is obviously important. You need to solve that first. And then, um, you know, whatever framework you have, you want to make sure that it's extensible because um, whether you're running uh, your own public cloud instance or you're providing a product, in our case, you want to make it easy to add new services into this framework because as new releases of OpenStack come out or as you build in new capabilities into your own product, you want to be able to add new services obviously onto that stack in a way that's reasonably seamless so that it fits into the whatever the deployment framework or the upgrade framework is. So in, in terms of um, flexibility, I just kind of mentioned this as, as a bit of a, to set the context for what exactly I mean. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, here we have an example of uh, the classic three-node controller setup. So all our, our main control plane services are running on, on, on the three-node cluster. So your API services, scheduler, volume manager, and also the supporting services, MySQL, RabbitMQ. So th this is a, a common one that I think a lot of people would be familiar with. Um, so we want something that allows you to kind of say, well, actually, I'd like to split out my services in a different way. For example, I might want metering monitoring logging to run on its own cluster or I'd like 
you know, my MySQL and RabbitMQ to have its own dedicated set of nodes because they're using up a lot of resources. So this is one aspect of the flexibility, so it's kind of the service topology, if you like. And here I'm showing a layout of, of networks, so basically separate VLANs where we want to isolate uh, different types of traffic. So um, this is just one example. So we have, you know, separated externally API traffic, guest traffic, and general management traffic. And, you know, that we have complete flexibility in this regard, whereas a, a particular customer could decide, actually, I'd like to have a separate network for carrying internal API traffic. And maybe I'm going to set up a separate network for carrying what I'm calling the configuration management traffic, if you like. So in our case, basically, the Ansible connections would be over this, this conf network. And kind of related to the, the kind of supporting of different network topologies. And, and what I'm talking about here is really network configuration on each of the nodes. I'm, I'm not talking about configuration of external switches. So the, the assumption here would be that you know, the consumer of this has, has set up their network according to the desired network model that they've, they've input into our product. So, you know, in association with that, then there's obviously configuration of network interfaces and nodes according to whatever services are running on the node and whatever networks those services need to connect to. So if you have a service that consumes RabbitMQ, then it needs to have a, um, a connection onto the, the network that's carrying RabbitMQ traffic. And then on top of that, there's also the op obviously the, an important option for, for bonding of NICs on nodes. So, so this is all kind of just um, giving an idea of the types of flexibility we have in terms of um, how you want to, to kind of lay out your cloud, basically how you des design your cloud before you go into the deployment. And the, fi the final bit I'll mention here is around disk partition layout. So this is another example of something that you might want to decide how, how you lay out disk partitions according to the services that are on each node. And again, here I've just shown examples where there may be a kind of a, a logical volume set up specifically for RabbitMQ or the Procona MySQL cluster. Okay, so that's really just it's kind of put a context of what I mean um, by flexibility. And this is, the, you know, the set of input data that we give to our Ansible playbooks um, supports all this, this range of configuration. So kind of the, the main thing I want to cover today is really how we model the general life cycle of a cloud and how we map that to Ansible. So to start off with, this is kind of a high level workflow of what happens when you uh, deploy a Helium OpenStack. Um, and I'm kind of showing the customer and developer viewpoint here because um, it's important to us that we have a developer environment that, that closely matches what happens in the real world. So to start off with, um, you know, a, a user of Haas will, uh, will set up a deployer based on, on ISO that we give them. Um, there's an assumption here, they've set up all their hardware, it's, it's ready, racked and networked um, and SSHable by, on, on, on some address. Um, and basically the first thing that we take ownership of is installing images, uh, basic OS images across your, your target nodes. And actually this is, is actually an optional phase, so we support the idea where some, you know, many um, uh, many customers may have their own tooling, in-house tooling for provisioning OS images. So in that regard, they can, they, can, they can opt for that instead and then just hop in at the later kind of purely Ansible phase. So in, in describing your cloud um, to kind of cover the range of configuration that I've talked about, we basically have a set of files which I've called cloud description there. So from my perspective, these are basically a set of YAML files, but there is you know, a GUI interface higher end that, that will just provide an easier to use interface for, for generating your, your desired cloud description. Um, so the first, um, if you decide to use so our uh, installation mechanism is based on cobbler. So we basically have cobbler installed on our deployer and that can install images across our target nodes. So we, we take those YAML files that describe how you want your services, network, disk partition layout, um, and we pass them into a component known as a config processor, which is basically a piece of Python software that consumes these models and generates a set of Ansible vars that are then consumed by our Ansible playbooks. Now, this isn't the only thing it does. It also creates, um, kind of one of the important jobs would be uh, allocating IP addresses based on the set of networks um, uh, you've, you've described in your input model. 
also generation of passwords based on the various kinds of users you need for your MySQL connection, RabbitMQ connections, and so on. So it does actually generate quite a bit of important information that needs to be persisted. Um, and in addition to that, it generates a set of Ansible bars and a host inventory for Ansible to consume. And then we basically have what I've called OS config and cloud deploy. And this is basically the two main aspects of our Ansible deployment. So OS config is around basic. So this is operating system, which is slightly confusing. Um, basic configuration of our target nodes. So pointing them to the apt repo for pulling packages, setting up DNS, configuring network devices. So this is a key part of this would be configuring the network um, devices on your node according to what, what services and what the requirements are. And then we move into cloud deploy, which is essentially um, deployment of all our OpenStack bits. And just to kind of briefly mention, I won't be going into our dev environment, but we have a dev environment which is based on Vagrant, where you can spin up a set of VMs and basically carry out the same kind of deployment across a set of VMs. And it, once you get to the, um, the point where you've described your cloud, you know, I mean, we would have sample models um, that are used in a dev for developers to use and also for that our CI tests are based on. Um, but you basically run the same set of playbooks, uh, the config processor, the OS config, and cloud deploy. And you can actually, um, the OS install part isn't really necessary in Vagrant, obviously, but we can run our cobbler mechanism against VMs as a test. Okay, so if I, if I look at the, um, the kind of operations that, that we considered a, a typical cloud operator to require, Here's kind of a sample list. So we have initial deploy, we have reconfigure. Um, so we're calling out reconfigure here, which is basically um, where I've decided I want to change a configuration of a particular service. So like changing configuration files for Cinda, Nova, so on. Um, switching on TLS on your internal API endpoints or switching it off. The, the, there's a set of changes that we would support and reconfigure that are distinct from, say, an upgrade. So you're not actually laying down any new uh, software bits on your nodes, you're just kind of changing existing configuration. So we thought it was convenient to have represent this as a separate. Other people might have different approaches. You, you know, you can always collapse everything into a single operation if you want to do it that way. Then we have upgrade, obviously, and uh, as I'll mention later, by upgrade I mean all variants of basically updating your software. So upgrade, major, minor, patch, release, hotfix, whatever you want to call it. And then there's other operations such as. You know, we've already deployed our cloud, now I want to add a new service to that existing node. And then there's obviously adding new nodes, so scaling out um, clusters or compute node, compute plane. And then the final one I'd mention here is, um, you know, for supporting kind of maintenance mode operation where you just basically want to isolate a certain set of nodes and I want to take all of the services on those nodes down and let me do some work on that node and, and bring it back up. So when we look at these, um, so I would tend to call these kind of high-level high life cycle operations. Um, we think about, we then thought about what, what do you need to do for each of your service, to, each of your services to support these kind of operations. And you'll, you know, quickly realize that there, there's a lot of common set of um, operations that you need to carry out on each of your service, services. So that could be Nova API, Nova Scheduler, Cinder Volume Manager, so on. So, you know, for something like a deployment, you're going to install, configure, start a service. And there's various other operations that we've kind of identified as we've gone through the different use cases. Um, you'll, you'll always get specific ones for certain services. This isn't saying every, every um, service that we install has to follow this model, but it's very useful if you have a consistent set of operations identified uh, across all your services. So if I look at something like deploy, you know, the common ex typical example would be all I need to do is install using whatever packaging format. So in our case, um, all our OpenStack services are installed as Python virtual environments. So that's how we achieve our isolation um, in terms of the, the Python dependencies at least. If I look at something like reconfigure, and maybe you'll decide I'm going to have a quies operation. So I, rather than just stopping a service, I might drain the service of existing requests, stop it change the configuration and possibly do some other operations if it's swift, do some ring management or whatever, um, and then restart the service. Or alternatively, I could just do something a bit simpler which says just configure and restart. And typically your configure would maybe set some flag to say, by the way, I've done something, you need to restart. 
And then here's an, another example, upgrade. So for upgrade, we identified some additional operations, um, notably a, a pre-upgrade and a post-upgrade phase. And I'll mention a bit about, about that later. So the, the kind of idea here really, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a standard software engineering principle that we, we want to identify a common set of operations so that when we, if we adopt these across all our Ansible roles and playbooks, we get this kind of reusability across the higher, high level operations like deploy and upgrade. And this is our way of dealing with future operations when we're doing our initial Ansible implementation. So very simply, each of those phases are kind of operate like install, configure, start, stop. We map them as a kind of an API for each of our Ansible roles. So if you take an Ansible role for a Nova API, we basically have within the task directory, for those of you who are familiar with Ansible, we have a separate playbook for install, configure, start, stop. And this model was adopted across all our Ansible roles. And then on top of that, at the kind of core service level for something like Nova, Cinder, Swift, we would have things like Nova Deploy, Nova Upgrade, Swift Deploy. So these are kind of high level per core service uh, set of playbooks, which you could essentially run on your own if you like. And then the kind of final piece is collecting all them together for kind of a, a, an Uber playbook that basically says, deploy my cloud, and that calls all of your services in, in a strict order. So um, it's worth mentioning that in, in our case, in HP, the responsibility of writing the Ansible uh, playbooks for the various services was on the service teams themselves. So we had separate um, Ansible repos for each of the service teams. And kind of one of the jobs of the, the lifecycle manager team was kind of setting out this template, providing sample playbooks. And we want to ensure that all our playbooks across the various services will follow the convention because invariably when you're debugging problems, you may be looking at problems with other service. If you're de debugging deployment issues, and it's much easier if everybody's followed an agreed template. And that this isn't the only reason, but it also serves the kind of reuse uh, function that I mentioned earlier. So just to kind of, kind of reiterate this, so I look at something like um, that service would be something like Nova Swift, okay? So it's at, at that kind of core service level. And if you look at Nova, then we have, what, if you like, a standard API into all our, our roles per service components. So something like the Nova Deploy Playbook will contain a set of plays, one play to install uh, Nova API, another for Nova Scheduler, if you like. And in doing the installation of Nova API Scheduler, it's using a kind of a standard API into, into each of those roles. So install, configure, start, stop. Okay, and th this is kind of showing you the same thing, but putting in the context of our overall um, framework, if you like. So again, we have, I have a specific example here of Nova, and you can see some of the roles, so Nova Scheduler, API, Conductor, and so on. Those top level operation playbooks, Nova Deploy, Nova Reconfigure, um, they, they will work on their own. They, they have, um, that's kind of the first kind of a deeper level interface into the Ansible implementation, if you like. Um, so just kind of reiterate the, the, you know, we have a set of cloud input model files. So this is kind of describing your ser service layout, sorry, service layout, network layout, and so on. We also have a set of separate service definitions that describe the relationships between services. So um, Cinder needs to consume RabbitMQ. And as part of that relationship definition, you say you define the users that are required and maybe any other resources. So if you're using, if you're consuming Percona, here's the database I need, here are the pribs I need on that database, that kind of thing. All that data is consumed by the config processor and used to generate the set of Ansible virus that are consumed by our playbooks. The one thing that's left is the actual configuration files for services themselves. And rather than wrapping this in a kind of a set of bars that you can say, you know, that you can specify that will ultimately get into configuration playbooks, we actually expose the configuration files directly to the, to the user. And what we're really doing is exposing the configuration template. So this is a Jinja 2 template in Ansible, so for each of the OpenStack configuration files. Um, so there's an area just kind of for convenience. The, um, basically, this is set up as a series of sim links on our deployer. But there's a config area where you can go in and say, OK, here's the Nova. Here's a set of defaults that Helion that provided. I can modify these. And we manage these using Git on the deployer. So we basically have a, 
a set of defaults provided by Helion, and then the customer can modify them on, on a separate branch and commit any changes. And then that's ultimately what gets consumed and rendered by our Ansible playbooks when we're doing a de deployment. And then the final bit, the kind of top level uh, aggregation of our playbooks. Um, here I preceded them with HLM. So HLM is Helion Lifecycle Manager. So we have a HLM deploy playbook that basically calls all of our deploy playbooks for each of the services in a specific order. So it, it will understand that you need things like Rabbit, Date, Percona, Keystone up earlier than other services for the, for the deployment to work. And then we have a similar model for upgrade, start, stop. I think what was useful here is when we were, you know, we started off with just HLM deploy, typically when we were working on this, when we were adding things like HLM start, stop, it was actually very easy to do because all our services kind of followed the model. So we kind of had this API into our Ansible roles in place and it wasn't actually that much extra work to add these extra kind of wrapper operations, if you like, around them. And this is kind of the main point around trying to structure our Ansible in the beginning to, to promote reusability. Okay, so just to mention a bit about upgrade. So obviously this is, um, you know, one of the most challenging uh, operations that we need to, to provide. And again, upgrade is update, patch, hotfix, whatever you want to call it. So we have the same mechanism for, for going, applying a patch release versus a, a major, you know, OpenStack, change in OpenStack release. And really, you know, some very simple ideas around how we, um, how we implemented our upgrade. And this is kind of showing a, a, a detailed flow here. The, the main idea is here is that first of all, when you're going to do an upgrade of your cloud, we first of all need to update the bits in the deployer. So in our case, we have Cobbler, we have the config processor component I mentioned. We need to update all of the artifacts, repos that we have for serving out virtual ends, for serving out apt packages, our RPMs, even in the case of, um, so our, our upcoming release will also support um, deployment on rel compute nodes. And then we have the Git repo that I mentioned that is for managing the customer um, customizations of the configuration files that we've applied. And so once we've updated all, all the bits on the deployer and moved, um, essentially, if you like, you could have installed 2.0, made some changes to the configuration file defaults that we had, and then we've supplied a new kit, which could be 2.1. We need to merge in those defaults. So this is basically a Git merge operation on the deployer. And once that's finished, um, if you have conflicts, you do need to, do need to resolve them. And um, there's always going to be an issue with conflicts between supplying defaults, um, changing defaults and newer releases on top of, of customer changes. So it has to be handled at some point. Uh, once you've that done, then you're at a point where you can actually run your upgrade. Okay, so just a bit more detail on, on the actual HLM upgrade playbook. Uh, roughly speaking, we have um, you know, we have a kind of core set of phases. A key thing we do at the start is we ran something called the HLM status playbook. And again, status is another one of these common operations that we implemented across all our roles. So very easily, you know, we had a status operation for Nova API scheduler, Cinder, uh, Volume Manager, Percona, RabbitMQ, KeepAliveD. So very, it was very easy to create uh, an aggregate uh, status playbook. And this, isn't, this is a very basic check to see service is running, a service is listening on a port. So this is no replacement for monitoring anything. This is kind of a, a pre-flight you know, deployment status check, if you like. So you know, one of the most important things in doing an upgrade is to make sure the system is in the expected state before you try making any changes. So we've basically error out at this point if anything goes wrong. And then there's kind of, you know, there's maybe two aspects, two main aspects to the upgrade of, of any target node in your, in your cloud. You want to update the packages. So, you know, we have virtual ends for each of our services, and then we also have HLinux packages in our case, which is the, the Debian variant uh, OS that, that we use. Um, so we, we begin by doing basically an apt get upgrade of all the packages on a node. Um, that could potentially cause problems for some services. So to allow for that, we have kind of a pre-upgrade phase, which is basically a placeholder for services to plug in checks. So um, we haven't had to, we, we've used this in a couple of cases where a service might say, actually, I don't want app to up update this, something like Percona. I don't want app to uh, update this, you know, leave me out and I'll handle it in my playbook. 
Um, but in the main, most of the packages are updated at this phase. Or maybe something like iSCSI, you've just noticed iSCSI has been updated. Um, I'd like to take out, carry out some preemptive action at this point, and then I'll let you go ahead and do the upgrade. So this, this is just a kind of a, and we provide this as a, in Ansible, we provide a fact that's passed into all of the service playbooks that they can quickly check to see, is this package being updated? I, I better do something. So we update the set of packages, so that's covered by the HLM upgrade base. And then we move into the upgrade phase, the OS config, which is updating uh, maybe the network configuration, some of the basic packages like NTP and whatever else we've, we've installed across all our nodes. And then the service upgrade is where we actually call into Nova upgrade, Cinder upgrade. And again, that's in, in a, in a predefined order that we've tested and, and no works. And when we go into the actual playbooks, um, the service upgrade playbooks, it's the same idea that we had in deployment. Um, we have a set of plays for each of the, the service components, and each of them have a, a set of operations, that the API, if you like, which is basically a, a set of methods that are supported here. OK, so just to give you an idea of what this looks like in practice, um, so if, I, if, you know, if, you're, if you're doing the deployment of, uh, of Haas, you'll start off by describing your cloud. So there's um, whatever you can use, the user GUI interface, or edit the YAML files. Typically what happens here, we would provide a, a set of sample uh, cloud layouts. And it's more common, rather than writing something from scratch, that you, you would adapt something like that. So kind of a small, medium, large, if you like, with various backends um, kind of configured into that, that cloud design. So once you've described your cloud, the first thing you do, and we've done everything in Ansible, so the config processor is invoked via an Ansible playbook that consumes that, um, does some validation in case you've, you've done something that doesn't look right, and then outputs a set of Ansible vars. Then we run what's called ready deployment, which is really kind of creating a scratch area for all of the playbooks and the Ansible vars for that particular operation that you're carrying out. And then we run site.yaml, which is basically uh, running the OS config phase and the deployment. So if this all works, you have a deployed cloud. If I look at something like upgrade, it's a very similar process. Um, again, there'll be potentially a new set of uh, bars to be generated. We ready our deployment. In this case, we're just running HLM upgrade playbook. I think where I've, I found the benefit in the, the way we've structured our Ansible is more for the kind of ancillary operations that we could kind of quickly create because we've structured our underlying Ansible in a certain way. So here's one example of, of HLM stop. So HLM stop is a playbook that literally just calls Nova stop, cinder start in a certain order. And um, where this is really useful is just calling that with a limit on a set of nodes. So I need to take a node out of action because I need to check it. I just run HLM stop and it turns off all of the services. But the point here is I was able to create that top level playbook without really requiring anything from the services because they'd already provided this kind of stop interface for each of the service components. And indeed the, the top level Nova stop, Cinder stop, and so on. And then there's a corresponding start. So this is kind of one of, one of the key ideas I, I'm kind of trying to get across. And similarly, we have something for HLM reconfigure, which calls um, the reconfigure for various services. And in some cases, kind of more advanced user, you can hop into running you know, the service-specific playbooks on their own. Um, and this is quite useful, say, for testing, uh, for developers just testing. Um, you know, Cinder upgrade, I can just iterate over that in my developer environment, um, <coughs> apply a change, and just run the Cinder upgrade playbook. So to finish, I just want to mention a bit about how, how we test this. Um, this is obviously an important part. What's, you know, the, the real goal of testing deployment is that you want to make sure this is repeatable and consistent, and this is a constant challenge. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a developer environment which is based on Vagrant, so this basically spins up a set of VMs representing your target cloud nodes. And the first CI job we would have implemented was one that, that spun up uh, the standard three node controller setup with a set of computes. So, this is what our, a lot of developers would use for, for testing out cloud deployments and even just testing out OpenStack changes. So they can spin up a virtual environment, <coughs> a vagrant environment with um, seven VMs in this example. Uh, we, we also have the option to 
to place the HLM on one of the controller nodes as well. That's kind of a more common use case. So what we would have done here is we would set up various sample models to represent the kind of different, um, you know, the, one of the challenges with supporting flexibility in your deployment is you can't test every possible combination um, that a customer might try. So you just try and get as much coverage for the, um, the different types of changes. So, you know, in the first case, we're testing a HA setup. In this case, we're testing split out of services across nodes, and this is where you find out issues. Of, by the way, if I um, move Salometer, it turns out it had some hidden dependency on Keystone being installed on the same node, so it's important to find out these, these kind of issues. So this is here, it's called a mid-scale, where we have um, separate clusters, but they're actually one node cluster because we, we just couldn't um, spin up so many clusters within our vagrant environment. We start to run out of memory. And then we even had an up, um, a CI job for testing upgrade. And this was great fun getting this working in the, in the first place. Okay, so just to finish up, um, you know, the basic idea is, you know, you need to think about upgrade and any future operations that you want to carry out in your cl cloud at the very start and build that into your design. Um, we've come up with this idea of, you know, a standard um, API for Ansible roles for, to promote reuse. Um, the kind of next major items that we're working on, obviously working through the Metaka deployment and upgrade, also building in support for deploying multiple regions. And in the aspect of extensibility, we're looking at um, how we have a, a kind of defined framework for putting in, plugging in third-party drivers into the existing services that we deploy, so different backends for Neutron and so on. Okay, that's it. Any, any questions? Could you use the mic, please? Sorry. Okay. How does this relate to the uh, OpenStack Ansible project? Well, this is essentially doing something quite similar to the OpenStack Ansible project. And when we begun on this, the, I'm not even sure if that project was in existence, but we, since we've learned about OpenStack Ansible, we actually have been in communication with, with Jesse and the, the, P, the current PTL. So we would have attended the the OpenStack Ansible mid-cycle um, a couple of months ago, and I, you know, presented some of our ideas. So what we're, what we'd like to do now is at, at least get to the point where we're sharing some of the problems we'd faced, um, you know, some of the upgrade issues, um, you know, issues in how to, how to deploy a RabbitMQ cluster and upgrade it without it falling apart, so that kind of thing. So there was actually a session just prior to this on a cross-project initiative for various deployments. So there's there's a few projects using Ansible, so there's the, the Blue Box Ursula project as well. Um, but this cross-project initiative is also around, you know, Chef, Triple O, Puppet. A lot of us are solving similar issues, because when I, when I do talks like this, invariably somebody comes up and says, oh yeah, we hit that exact same problem, um, and we all hit it at different times. So we, we definitely need to work on, if we're not converged on the same project, at the very least, work on sharing our ideas to, to kind of get you know, basically we want to improve the experience of deploying OpenStack for everybody, so it's important that we share these ideas in some way. Hey, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have some security related question here. So in Ansible playbooks, uh, passwords are put in plain text in some of the JSON files. So do you have any best practice preventing the, uh, that flaw? So, yeah, so we, we would encrypt the passwords and they would be encrypted into Ansible Vault, so it's... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I have a question. How do you test uh, HA scenarios when you have a couple of services on different servers and um, you need to stop a one or just uh, orchestrate with all other services? Is it covered in your uh, playbooks? Yeah, so the, or the orchestration is, is actually, um, I, I didn't touch on this, but the orchestration of services is, is quite a challenge. Um, not so much for your stateless services, where we can just effectively in Ansible do a serial upgrade, and as long as you have one of them up. Where we ran into issues was around upgrading Keep Alive D, or not so much Keep Alive D, actually making changes that affected the network interface. Network configuration caused issues with Keep Alive D, so you do have to... Um, 
you know, wh while you might come up with a kind of generic mechanism for upgrade, every time you do a new release, you're going to hit new challenges. For example, for Kona, in our upcoming release, we went from 5.5 to 5.6, and it turns out they're not compatible with each other, so you can't just update on a rolling deploy. You pretty much have to bring down the cluster. And an another question, so do you have some fallback scenarios if on some particular case something went unexpectedly wrong? So do you have some, mm, you, uh, do you stop uh, upgrade process or just do some something else just to cover this uh, issue? Yeah, well, the, the main goal would be to stop as early as possible, so kind of fail fast. So that, that's part of the, I would have mentioned this kind of high level status operation. And as it turns out, each of the service playbooks would also, so it's, you might check the status of your cloud before you run HLM upgrade. And then you've upgraded a few services and they've done, somebody's done something wrong. So we would have the services of actually, so Nova, Swift, Cinder would have in, interim status checks. You could always improve on this. You know, basically you want to make sure you can find the error before you get to a, a, a problematic state. Okay, thank you. And uh, the last question, y you mentioned uh, Helium a couple times. Uh, do you have uh, open source version? Yeah, so there's a, there's a link there where we, where we published um, a snapshot of the code from the 2.0 release. So the okay, thank you. Is, yeah. Thank you.